Good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Tagg, the director of the Graduate Program in Branding and Integrated Communications, or BIC, at the City College of New York. I'm so excited to welcome you all to our first at BIC lecture of the year, Love Me, Love Me Not, a conversation with creative directors Castro Disroches and Steve Horn, the driving force behind this year's most awarded campaign for Apple's Beats by Dre, You Love Me. Uh, normally, I, I wish we were all on campus together, but I know that the it's a little ominous and hopefully being here on Zoom, means that more of us can participate in tonight's at BIC lecture. We've all entered you on our Zoom session off mic and without video, but if you could also go to the video instructions at the bottom of the screen and check the box that says hide non-video participants. I don't know if that's easy for you to find or not, but if you could do that, um, that will help you have a more um, intimate experience um, with tonight's presentation, and I think you'll really enjoy it. We'll also later on, um, as time comes in, we're for Q&A, and at that time, we'd love for you to come back in on video um, and audio. So um, in addition to reading some of the questions that you put up in the chat, um, you'll actually be able to ask them yourself. So over the years, our At BIC lecture series has welcomed industry thought leaders, provocateurs, authors, and philosophers. A couple of years ago, we bookended the school year with Michael Roth of IPG in the fall and Sir Martin Sorrell in the spring. I always think of that as our big, big bookended At BIC lecture series. At BIC, At BIC is where Scott Goodson, CEO of Strawberry Frog, has spoken about brand purpose. Julius Dunn and Shamika Brown talked about leading with intention. Paula Scher introduced her latest branding project and where BIC board member Barry Rafferty gave us top notes on her trip to Davos. Let me tell you why I'm so psyched for tonight's at BIC conversation with Castro and Steve. As most of you know, BIC is the only master's degree program to teach branding and integrated communications in an integrated way. We work in a cross-disciplinary and collaborative environment in order to explore how brands add value to a company, its community, and society. That makes Castro and Steve's branding effort for Beats by Dre incredibly BIC-like and why it's the focus of our conversation tonight. When You Love Me launched last year, it became an instant sensation propelled forward by the murder of George Floyd and the intensity of the Black Lives Matter movement, the short video directed by Melina Matsukas features a range of recognizable features such as tennis champ Naomi Osaka, NASCAR driver Bubba Wallace, rapper Lil Baby, activist Jenea Future Khan, as well as ordinary people. It honors Black culture, celebrates Black accomplishments, showcases black celebrity, all by making vividly clear a hypocritical reality. Americans love black culture, but do they love black people? It's powerful and provocative. Let me share it with you now and we'll have the conversation on the other side of the, on the, other side of the video. You love me. You love me not. Goodbye. You love black culture, but do you love me? You love how I sound, my voice, these beats, this flow. Not me though, right? You love how I look, my hair, this skin, but me? Nah, we don't get to exist, we're forced to survive, we still fight, we still play while the world burns, on fields that ain't even level. All men are created equal, <laughs> that's my favorite part. You hate us so deeply, 
but you're still so impressed. Why can't you see? There's history in our skin. You built this country on our backs. I'm him. He's me. She. Us. We. Are all black. Black. Love me or not, we love each other deeply. We gonna be us. We gonna break bread. We gonna defy gravity. You love my culture, but do you love me? <laughs> What a world that would be. Um, wow. Um, so what a world that would be. So that piece is not just profound. I actually think it's a miracle. Uh, so let's bring in the miracle workers into this conversation. And by the way, this is a conversation. So everybody, please add your questions and comments to the chat so we can build uh, you into that conversation. So Steve Horn and Castro Desroches, please turn on your video and join me in the Hey guys. Hello. Hello, hello. It's, it seems like I just saw you like two minutes ago. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's, it's just such a privilege and actually an honor. And I really wanna also congratulate you on this amazing campaign. Um, for the audience, I wanna just do a really quick intro to our guest tonight. So Steve Horn, uh, creative director and Emmy nominated copywriter at Translation, Agency Translation, with clients who include obviously Beats by Dre, the NBA, KitchenAid, Maytag, and Whirlpool. By the way, Steve, I just want you to know that my parents did think about naming me May at some point, but then put the tag with it. So I'm just like, like looking at Maytag. I don't see that very often. <laughs> and I will, I want to note because we're going to talk about Castro's academic background that Steve is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin, where he majored in journalism and political science. So um, maybe maybe some academic cred there for, for some of the thinking that, that you're doing. And now, and Castro Disroches, up at least for me, over to my left, creative and art director, also at Translation, who's done work for Rivian, Twizzlers, Under Armour, Prudential, Google, Instagram portfolio. I have to say Castro at our open house a few minutes ago, uh, we did the sizzle reel and the last half of it is yours. <laughs> Castro is a double graduate of City College where he got his master's degree from BIC. So this gives me incredible pride bringing him in on the grid, especially since Castro, you do not know this, you are the first at BIC guest who is also an alum. So. Welcome guys, welcome into the grid. Thank you for joining us for this conversation. Um, I have so many questions to ask you and I'm sure I won't get to hardly any of them, but I have one big kickoff question that hopefully will just let you guys run with it. Um, so this was, as, as you informed me, I did not know that this was translations actually their first effort for Beats by Dre. So this was a new client of yours in essence, which I think is pretty amazing. And Steve, you had mentioned that at one point or some points very early in the process, the campaign kind of started out about a product, you know, what's, what's the next color kind of thing, very product centric type of campaign. And then it turned into something very different. And you guys went on a very long and very different journey that ended up with, you love me. So as an advertising agency and, and a number of people who are um, guests tonight, um, are interested in this. This is kind of like the, the two differences between selling a product, something material, something concrete, something technological, and then building brand, brand value and, and the differences between those two. You guys obviously leaned in to the second part of that. Um, and that is what allowed you to make this work, what I think of as a cultural conversation and stimulant. So tell me a little bit 
about the distinctions and then about the journey that you took that, that turned into You Love Me. Cass, do you wanna do it? You're the alumni, I'm, I'm just here. You, or do you want me to say when I passed it off to you? I'm happy to do that too. There was no or passing, we, you could start off <laughs> the first initial brief. Sure. Yes, um, so the initial, initial thing that happened, actually they're maybe sitting somewhere over here. Oh yeah, uh, Power Beats Pro came in these pretty colors uh, and these ones were blue, but there was also pink and yellow and other crappy summery colors. Um, and Beats was kind of looking to do a bit of a cultural reset as a brand and look to new agencies and talk to new people. Um, so they came to us with this product launch um, in the summer of 2020. I think it was like April maybe, um, pretty fresh into the pandemic in a lot of ways. Um, they wanted to celebrate creators and people who didn't let quarantine slow them down and you know, sticking out even despite the fact you don't have a stage or a concert tour to go on, there were people that much like these stupid colored headphones were doing unique, remarkable, outlandish, colorful things uh, in the face of a global pandemic. So it was an interesting brief and, and Beats obviously fancied themselves as great marketers and I think wanted to work with a place like Translation and Steve, not this Steve, our CEO Steve has a lot of connects in the music industry and it just seemed like a good fit. Um, and then obviously uh, Memorial Day 2020 hits and uh, George Floyd is murdered and we kind of have a bit of a reckoning as an agency. Beats has a bit of a reckoning as a brand about you know their place in the world, things that they've done to capitalize on black lives throughout their existence as a brand, but also who they are as a brand because uh, you know they still bear Dr. Dre's name on the door of their company. Um, so that was all kind of in a very tight vacuum, what we were working within and resetting the brief and talking about, do headphones actually make any sense to be talking about right now? Do brands have anything to say? Do they have a, a space to play at all? And if they do, what can they you know, logically do and say that makes sense and, and makes a difference? Um, and then Cass and I started working together. We both had different partners. Um, and again, with the world shifting, we ended up kind of, combining creative forces a bit. Um, so I'll shut up and let Cass talk now about what happened from then on out. <laughs> yeah, the hard part, right? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, there was a ton of different variations of messages that we went through uh, from, you know, the typical capturing, you know, when life imitates art, or, um, art imitates life, right? We're capturing, BLM in the streets, what that would look like. Uh, then there was a, a variation of, you know, having appetite to, to create an eight minute, 46 second film even. Uh, so we were, we were, Steve and I were like literally in the cave, like posted notes on the wall, making a movie, like a real short, like an eight minute, nine minute short film, which was nuts um, at the time. And then we focused in and, you know, started listening a little bit more um, and, and credit to one of our team members, Ritesh, who isolated a, a particular moment. Um, it, it, was, it was a compound of things, right? It was like initial thinking from early summer from a, a partner and I to another, um, another creative sort of isolating Doc Rivers, who, who was the then coach of the Clippers uh, and how he felt towards, <clears throat> I think it was another shooting actually in, uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, the Jacob Blake shooting. Yeah, Jacob Blake shooting right. In a press conference in the bubble. Right. So that was, you know, weighing heavy on everyone's hearts and minds. And it kind of reinforced to the team on translation side and beat side that like, this is, <laughs> this is a very needed message, whatever the message is, it's, it's like, it needed to be communicated and there's only a handful of brands that can do it um, in an authentic way uh, as we sort of, you know, as B sort of like comes from the source, if you will, right? Uh, I think other, brand, other brands can sort of align themselves and like sit next to the movement 
but um, the very DNA of, of beats is very much from, you know, Dr. Dre, fuck the police. Like this is, this is the embodiment of, of his brand. And as we all know, Beats by Dre is, it kind of like came out the gate dripping with that kind of um, swag for lack of a better word. Um, so yeah, um, tons of different variations. The message was foggy, but the, the, the harder we worked on it, the more we poured ourselves into it, the, the clearer it got. Um, and I think things focus and sharpen once we had Melina Mitsukis, our director on board, who if you're not familiar with, directed Queen and Slim. Uh, if you watched Insecure last night, she directed that um, first episode and many other episodes before that. Uh, Lena Way who uh, penned this with, with Steve right here, uh, who's, who's uh, responsible for the Chicago series. Um, it got sharper as we got, as we came along and we literally um, came to a, a, a fine point. Uh, you could say two weeks, three weeks before we actually shipped the thing. Um, so yeah, that is the long answer to the I, question. And to make it even longer too, I, I will say that this was the most untraditional yeah. process of filming a commercial I've, I've ever been a part of, so much so that we had Melina on board. I was sitting on phone calls with Lena talking about words of a thing we weren't even quite sure of what we were making until probably the last week it came out. You know, these were trusted partners on the client side, on the creative side, who like, like Cass said, we didn't really know what the shape of the thing was, but we were all invested in it in a way that it, it was one of the biggest creative gifts I've ever had because to sit on a call with someone like Melina and let her sharpen her visual world around it and to hear words of a script that we're not like locking this script until the day we launch. So people are invested, people are changing it, people are looking at it with a fine, fine, fine microscope, making sure we're doing and saying the right things, which like normally you write a script, client buys it, you call a director, they shoot it, and then you ship the thing you basically said you were going to make. This was not that in any way. So much so that we had calls with directors that straight up said like, don't, don't do this. Like, I, I don't want to touch this. You guys shouldn't touch this. Like, let's not. So, you know, that is not normal. And in many ways people needed to be invested in it in a way that wasn't normal. Um, so it, yeah, it, it took a lot of, a lot of forms to get to the two minute thing we just watched. To underline that point, um, there was one director in particular who I won't name, <laughs> I won't name the name, but it's, pretty, it's a pretty important name. Um, essentially, they said that they took the call just to hear what we had to say, but they never intended on actually uh, going through with it <laughs> based off the creative that was there. This was early summer, so it was very different. It looked very different. But they wanted to communicate to us that, um, that what we had what we were embarking on was very important because there's a there's only a few things that the black, the black community from a brand perspective kind of take ownership of and feel like they have a personal connection to um and that's beats that's one and how connect how connected beats was to music which was right, undoubtedly right. the black community has been incredibly influential you know i think hip-hop is probably more influential than any genre of music. Um, you can fight me on that, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, he, he went on to mention how important what we were, how important it is what we were doing and not to disappoint the community. Um, so. That, I mean, geez, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> No pressure at all. I mean, I, I'm listening to this process and Steve, thanks for pointing out that it's really unconventional. Um, which, and it involves um, so much trust with the client, which is why when you mentioned that this was the first project you ever did with them, it's, it's on, on some hand, it's like, that's the only time you get to do this, the very first time, or it's based on a relationship that you've built over the years can give you some space to let this 
this thing evolve. But Castro, oh my God, for someone to say, I just wanted to hear what you were doing and don't disappoint. What a, <laughs> yeah, it's all on you, man. I mean, it's all on your shoulders. Tell, tell the, the audience for those who, who don't, I think, cause you know, you had a conversation with Miriam um, who was in the BIC program a while ago and you, I think it was you who mentioned that the coach that made that statement. Um, tell us who that coach was again and, 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 and make that statement because I think to me that could be, as you said, it was this evolving thing, might be a bit of a pivot point in terms of you kind of knew, it started to take shape based on that statement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was Doc Rivers, who's a black coach, one of the handful of black coaches in the NBA. And at a press conference, I think maybe the games might have been canceled. Uh, this was like the beginning of the bubble. I think the Milwaukee Bucks even um, decided to, to do a walk off and, and you know, decide not to play. And he was literally in tears and said, you know, they started a fire alarm. Take it from here, Steve. No. Is that... I got you. Cass, well, he's burning his house is actually on fire. There. <laughs> I'll pick it up for five minutes, and if he still doesn't show back up, we'll I'll run over there. I know where he lives. Um, but uh, yeah, the Doc Rivers quote came out again. I think that must have been June or July, probably of the summer. Um, and I th I think it was pretty simply you know doc was crying at the press conference and he basically said like we've proven how much we love this country and this country proves time and time again they don't love us so it wasn't so pointed in, in a small kind of consumable package like you love me ended up being but it was a very clear distinction of like okay beats has a place in culture around sport beats has a place in culture around music beats has for a long time basically just put their headphones on famous people and rode the clout of that to profit off of it. And, you know, again, they do have a space to play in the world of culture and they have a steward of their brand who can somewhat get away with that. But it was a real reckoning of like, okay, this is getting closer to what we need to talk about. This isn't just a poem about black life as beautiful as that would be. It wouldn't be pointed and directed in a way that it, that it needs to be if Beats is going to try to do something like this. So once we started playing in that space around like the love of culture, which we very much have a stake in, Black culture aside, like we had to get a little finer point on that, but it was becoming very clear that that was a lane that made a lot of sense from a narrative perspective. Melina's original treatment for the idea was all about basically the act of living as an act of protest. So we don't need to show buildings on fire. We don't need to show marches. We don't need to show anything but humanity on screen, which for us as a treatment made a ton of sense. But again, that is not finite enough to sell an idea and get crystal clear on a narrative. Um, so we knew we were dancing around culture. We knew we were playing in a space that had something to do with the act of loving or lack thereof of loving. Um, and then Castro went to an art museum and saw a painting of a flower. And then he like called everyone at midnight and was like, I think this is the thing. And it absolutely was the thing. So I'll shut up again and let Cass tell you about the painting he saw. Cause it was, I, I don't know if it was that magical, but from the outside, <laughs> it was like Cass went to a museum and got inspired and changed everything. So Cass, well, now that you're building it, wasn't, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a museum. It was just a, it was just some house decor. Uh, <laughs> but I was in Holland. I was working from Holland um, during production. I think it was like, I was there for three weeks. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the time difference was crazy and it was getting to me and uh, my hours were insane. So it probably helped um, in a weird way <laughs> for me. But yeah, I saw there was a, a painting of a flower and I'm going to age myself, but Macaulay Culkin's My Girl came to mind, which was a long, long time ago. And he, there was a section uh, of the movie, maybe, it was maybe towards the end where the, the little girl dies or, you know, Macaulay was trying to sort of profess his love and just was trying to decide if, if he should or not. And he said, you love me, you love me not, you love me, you love me not, picking each petal until the very end. 
And that was sort of like, um, wow, that's, that should be sort of like the flow of the beginning, you know? Um, it's a perfect summation of the thesis, uh, which is the, you know, love the culture, don't necessarily love the people. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very pure distillation of, of that. And I think once you get to a really, really sharp point in finding that, like two or three words that say everything you need to say, and then you can sort of expand on it, I think that really opened it up for us. I, I hope everyone, I mean, we're recording this, so I'm gonna just play that back, Castro, again and again and again, um, because I actually think that's part of the power of the piece is that it's framed in this kind of innocent um, child, you know, I mean, we play that game as a kid and I, and I, and it's so clear and it's so yes or no, it's so here or there. And, and yet our, our thinking about it is, is, is very childlike, innocent. And it, and it's not the images that you're saying, and it's not the themes that you're portraying, it's so much more, it's, it's that juxtaposition and that tension between those two that I think is, 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 that, is at the heart of its um, success. So I'm so glad that you said that because I, I was, it, it, and I just had somebody say that was the question I was gonna ask. So you answered the question and it's, and it's so profound to me. I think you also said something the other day when we were talking that is so powerful um, that I want you to repeat it here and you and Steve can, can talk about it further is that you didn't want to put anything in it that would give a reason to tune out. Um, talk, talk a little bit about that. I, I think that's a, it's kind of like a North Star, right? Is, is making those decisions in the editing room and the, you know, when you're shooting it at so many points is we don't want anyone to tune out or at least in particular, talk about this too, people that you, you want to reach to now in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for racist white America, there's a, there's a few trigger words. There's, there's, there's some rhetoric, right? Like people can, can already hear and then that activates a switch in them to like turn off their minds, turn off their brains and they can't hear anything else because you, you've, you've already triggered them with a set of words that they've heard before that they associate with, you know, this is, this is bullshit, this is nonsense, I don't want to hear. But what we, what we aim to do in act one was to really sort of like, I think we used to call it inception maybe, you know, just like drop a seed into someone's brain and slowly, slowly sort of poke at the thinking, you know? And I think, I think Steve did a, like a great job in really crafting that moment. Um, so if you remember how it starts, it's like, you love how I, you love how I look, my hair, my, <clears throat> said and I don't remember right now but um it's it's a very soft opening you know it's like asking really quiet um almost childlike questions like you said um uh to really bring people in whether you're racist or not you know and you kind of start wondering if that person is right if that person's talking to you right so you're asking yourself these questions um act two is when we start saying a lot more of the realness, <laughs> you know? And act three is for the community at large. We're not talking to uh, the same people anymore. Um, but yeah, that was, that was the aim. And we really tried to make sure that um, people came into this with, with an open mind and hooked them in when they didn't intend to, intend to be hooked in um, so that they can carry the full weight of the message by the time they got there. I think too, like part of the the gift of having time and space to craft the thing and change the thing and tweak the thing, we started to realize like I don't think we unlocked that or cast didn't see the flower until like a week before. But what we had in the can was footage, very raw footage of very famous people and beautiful footage of people that no one knew who they were. So we. We were able to then do the thing that Cass is talking about, which is put those things out of juxtaposition, put them in front of people that the second you see Bubba Wallace, no matter how you feel about him, you can start to almost trick people into looking and questioning and thinking and hearing the words in a way that doesn't immediately send you out. Because I think part of what we had to do 
or what we got to do, I should say, was Lena, her initial writing around the piece was like some of the most beautiful, raw, just like almost stream of consciousness writing we've I've personally ever been able to read. Like to see that in your inbox is like one of the wildest things that could ever happen. But in doing that, we then got to break out those words in a way that gave them structure and shape, which she was super down for, like to see this little piece that she has about all men are created equal. That's my favorite part, basically shitting on the entire U S constitution. Like you can't do that right away. You kind of have to like get to a point to like break open the U S constitution in people's ears. Um, but again, we had that right. We had that time. We had the space to do that and look at it and pair it with different images and move them around. And, you know, I, I don't think we like go soft right away. It, it like catches your ear, but we do kind of do a bit of like unwrapping and unraveling and going deeper and deeper and deeper um, in a way that I don't think we could have done if we would have just had to hit go once we had have all the footage in the can and had some kind of rough script in the can. I, I think that touches upon too, what you said is a very unconventional process. I'm, I'm just not seeing this piece with a shooting board. <laughs> with a scratch track underneath it and we have to hit all these points in fact it seems like once the footage was there and once the idea of this kind of you love me you love me not you you realized you actually had some back and forth tension to play with that almost became more and more apparent as it got more and more physically real to you um which is is which is an amazing thing I have somebody that's written a question about that one. Um, and I'm, so I'm gonna read, read the question out loud to you. Love that you said it got sharper as you all continued working on the vision. I can imagine the responsibility that was felt in creating such a monumental piece of art. During the process of manifesting this vision, were there any hurdles you all had to overcome emotionally, mentally, physically, energetically? How were you all able to come together in those moments to build each other up? How many hurt? I mean, yeah, millions of hurt. <laughs> Cast, take it, take it yeah, away. No, it was it was really tough. I mean, you're talking about trying to pour yourself into your work while also being. Well, for me, you know, for me, like being a being a black man still living in America during COVID time, where you're stuck on a Zoom square, while also hearing, you know, like your your outlet for shutting off your brain, which is probably social media, Instagram, and there's constant, you know, this man got shot today, this man got shot today, this woman got shot today, um, so it was exhausting absolutely exhausting there's nowhere to really turn to for any reprieve um maybe video games but you know it's just like even there you're shooting things right but uh it's like, sidebar yeah really bad really bad um but yeah it was it was really tough um i can't say it would have worked in a different world though you know, I think it, 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 it was one of those pieces that demanded your complete attention. And I think the kind the pressure that was bestowed upon us um, and the brand and, and the, the very brand that it was sort of enlisted by, it, it just felt like, okay, we, if anyone's gonna do it, it's gonna be us because we care that much to do it right. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, again, no pressure. Um, knowing that there was a release date too. Tell me, tell me a little bit about the timing of the release. And then because in, in such an evolving project, that gives you an endpoint. So you knew, right? You knew you had to produce it, you knew you had to broadcast it and air it. Tell us a little bit about the choices of the release, um, timing of it but also um, the reactions that you got and how you guys responded to them. Steve, you wanna go? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I will say I, I wish it was as clean as we have this media buy and we are releasing this thing on this day. But I think the the goalpost moved probably five or six times in the making of it. And again, that's looking back is actually a great thing that we had time to move and time to push. But, you know, like Cass said, there was a there was a world in which we were going to make an eight minute and 46 second film, which takes a long time. And it needs to come out on a very specific thing because then you have to release it like a movie. And there was talks of doing it on the anniversary of George Floyd's death or on his birthday or things that just felt so um, not cheap, but just felt like maybe this isn't what we're actually making. Maybe we don't need to do something that comes out in that way or in that space yeah. on behalf of a brand now that we're getting, you know, inspired by, but not doing that thing necessarily. Um, but there is always, you know, and actually I didn't remember this until we talked to Nancy last week. Uh, we did have some thinking around the launch and the timing of when it was all going to come out, knowing that we were now focused in a very, not small space, but in a very specific thing of black culture and music and sport. Um, and when we had Naomi on board and all these things that, that started to take shape. So it came out very purposefully during the NBA draft. Uh, Beats has all these different brand ambassadors who are in the NBA. They were going to sign two guys that got drafted that night, um, Anthony Edwards and Jalen Green, I believe. And, and there was just this, you know, if we're actually going to talk about this and no longer just put headphones on people and benefit off and profit off of their likeness, maybe we can do something around the fact that, hey, this draft is happening, but let's not forget this isn't just sport for sport's sake. There's, there's something to say. So the piece came out during the NBA draft, and then it also aired on television which is why Castro's painting discovery was so important because at two minutes, you can really unpack that story, but you need to be very pointed in the you love me, you love me not space at like a 30 second timestamp. So a version of the film came out at 30 seconds during uh, the Thanksgiving football broadcast, um, which again, felt like a very specific time and place to be talking to people. That's a generally just in the mass scheme of things, a very white audience gathered around televisions with very white people looking at a league that is basically, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, a black sport, despite people putting quarterbacks on this weird pedestal. But, you know, Thanksgiving felt like it had its own kind of big meaning. We also found out later that apparently the Masters of None episode that Lena and Melina won an Emmy for came out on Thanksgiving. Uh, Queen and Slim premiered on Thanksgiving, and then this came out on TV on Thanksgiving. So maybe they were always cooking that up in the background without us ever knowing. And and let's not forget, it just so happened to be two or three days um, before the anniversary of a great battle between the Haitians and the French that... Um, was in November 18th of 1803, which is when, which is when the Haitians sort of, um, not sort of uh, gained their independence uh, a month after. So that, and that was actually captured within the painting of Naomi Osaka. So if anyone says we did that, we did it on purpose, but we, <laughs> only on, everyone knows here that um, it was a, it was an unbelievable coincidence. <laughs> Well, that, and, I have to ask when, when we speak about this campaign, when, whether you guys are in the grid or not, you know, talk, you can talk about this campaign forever. And I think people are going to unpack it and talk about symbolism and all this kind of stuff. It, it really is that, that powerful um, and works on so many different levels. And when we spoke last week, um, everything sounds, everything that you did sounds so intentional. Um, and I think that's another reason why, you know, it, it, it's, it's not random. There was a lot of thought put behind this. And the other thing that you guys said, and you touched upon it, Steve, about kind of, should we release it on the anniversary? Or does that just sound too concepty? That just sounds, you know, it's it, it like, it could make sense, but is that a little hollow? And so as creatives, you, you kind of love the packaging and, and you guys made some you resisted a lot of things that would have kind of undermined some of the power, I, th I think of it. Um, but I'm also curious, Catherine, because you just mentioned the portrait in, in the piece. Um, tell us about some more kind of happy accidents that happened now that you've, now that you've let 
the time pass and you're you're thinking about it going, man, how did that happen? I'm so glad we did that. Or um well can't I can't no happy accidents come to mind right now, but I can tell you some of the intentional um subtle ones that um maybe not everyone knows. Naomi is actually wearing uh a designer called um, a, des a designer called Pierre Moss, which is a Haitian American. Uh, it's pretty big right now. Um, so her, she's wearing head to toe Pierre Moss, which is like was such a great win <laughs> for me. Because <laughs> not only is it not only is it a traditional sort of look and scene from her, but it, it, she's also very you know she's she's a young woman. Uh, she's a modern. Haitian, uh, Haitian uh, Japanese woman, so didn't want to necessarily, you know, show her as a caricature of 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 herself in, in a space where she's wearing a costume. It feels like something that she would actually wear. Yeah, yeah. So that was important. Um, the the young boy arising out of the water at the end is sort of like a, a nod to um, the choir. In the beginning, uh, in the middle of the film, you know how the black community is deeply religious, um, majority of them. So that was sort of like a rebirth uh, that occurred, you know, where self, when you self, when you acknowledge, uh, when the community acknowledges for itself that you don't necessarily need that love back to, to succeed or, or feel fulfilled, that's when you're sort of, you know, that's when you can sort of like be free and, and, and be reborn within and be happy within your own um, space, you know, as a human. Um, so there was that. Uh, the cowboys on the horses is sort of like a reappropriation of, uh, you know, those those statues that were torn down, uh, but now in real life and now now black, yeah, concrete cowboys. Sure, yeah. <laughs> now it's now it's us standing on those horses now. Um, from the ashes of, you know, the slave owners that, uh, that were torn down. Um, those men um, on the, in, the, in, the, in the street that were all lying down uh, next to each other, it was all black and white. It's kind of obviously a, like a, a nod to the slain men that, you know, we've seen time and time again um, in the news. But at the same time, there it's it's kind of it's kind of intimate, kind of sensual in the way that they're sort of embracing each other, and they're not, you know, from afar it looks like they're they're slain and they're dead, um, but when you get a little closer, you can see that they're very much alive and they're very much in support of each other. Uh, every shot, and I'm sure Steve can take the baton and keep going, but every shot is like littered with with subtext. I also don't want Cass to just breeze over the fact that he is a uh, Haitian man and the amount of detail that he poured into every element of that Naomi scene from the painting to the cast. Like we were on a Zoom call, a casting call um, with the, the family that Naomi's sharing a meal with, kind of her chosen family in that scene. We were supposed to have Naomi's actual family, but they couldn't travel because of COVID. But we didn't just want to like willy nilly get some people to sit around a table and like, yeah, they're not Haitian, but like they're from the Caribbean. So it's good enough, like whatever. Cass was on a Zoom call speaking Creole with the grandma asking her like how she made the food and if he could have a plate. And, you know, there, there was no stone unturned he was texting his mom just like random prop dressings like mom would you put these plates out on your table and if not how about these like we were very much making specific specific decisions that a lot of times in a stupid advertising production you just kind of dismiss and you don't care about and I think it in general, every again, every frame has meaning, and every every moment has added symbolism that Melina helped us unlock and and paint. But it was such a learning experience around like don't take anything for granted in these decisions that we have to make that seem superfluous and seem super super frivolous, like the plates that are going to be on a table. Um, 
And so much so that if you like read the YouTube comments, which I, it's a scary place generally, but if you go to the YouTube comments, people are dropping Haitian flag emojis to this day because I think there's such a moment of feeling seen in the work and our like, you know, data science team shared an amazing stat with us, which is on Haitian Independence Day, which is like seven or eight months after the film came out, the viewership spiked again like almost to a point it didn't get the millions of views it got on the first day but like hundreds of thousands of people reshared the piece on haitian independence day which like i cast maybe you're too close to it but that shit is so amazing to me that like that you were pouring so much of yourself into the work not just that scene obviously but like i mean that that just goes to show that texting your mom at midnight was not for not you know that's like a there was a, a ton of care taken. Um, I have the text. Yeah. <laughs> Let me show you. Hold on. Also, there was a in the in getting Kirby Jean Ramon to sign off on Naomi's outfit. Like we were fighting with Naomi's stylist, but it turns out we were just looking for the same the same outfit that her stylist was looking for. So it was all it all paid off. <laughs> that is so awesome. <laughs> That is, you know, it is, is too. It's like, I'm so glad, again, I'm so glad we're recording this. It, you know, it's like, you know, centuries later, we sit around and ask whether Melville meant that in Moby Dick, or was that, is that symbolism re, we're reading into it? I know, like, no, we got it here. I mean, you guys were actually really, I mean, I'm sure people will, will see other things into it as well, which is part of the life that it has. Um, but to know that, so much of it, I, and I said, so intentional. Um, every, this, this whole pro, and which also seems like a contradiction when you started by saying, and it just kind of just kept evolving and glow, growing, right? It, 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 it shows that those two things um, can live at the same time, the intentionality and the, the ability to be evolving and thinking and, and, and it creating something as it goes. I, I mean, we're, um, I could talk to you guys about this all day. I'm telling you, as an English major, this is like the idea of layering the analysis. Oh, it's such a beautiful, powerful spot. And it really, as I said, it's a, it's a cultural stimulant. It really allows us, it, it's, it's, a, it's a catalyst for us to have these conversations. I'm gonna allow um, everybody, I would love everybody to come back on video. And there's a bunch of really interesting questions here. If you wanna read them out loud, but as you kind of repopulate the grid, if you could come on video and, and, and show yourselves and otherwise I'll, I'm happy to read from the, from the chat. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that this campaign won the highest honors in every single award show this year. And every, every so often there's that, that campaign that just cleans up and I'm so, happy that this is the one that did it this year. Um, so bravo to you guys for being recognized. You didn't, I, I'm just kind of curious of, as to whether um, when you got those awards, whether that was just kind of, oh, that's nice. And whether you're expecting some kind of recognition or when it started, I mean, it must've been so enormously gratifying. So. Um, yeah. Um it, you know, the internet does what it wants. It declares who the winners are, right? Um, I think with this one, you, you never know how it's gonna go uh, because the majority of the folks that are watching this is, is white America, whether they're racist or not. So it, 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 can, it can take a wrong turn if, if people feel pointed at. Um, uh, so, we never, we, we didn't know. We just knew for a certain audience it would, it would hit. Um, but for it, to, for it to actually win, win awards and um, more people see it because it won over and over um, in different, different levels, you know, um, whether you're in America or in London or uh, with DNAD in Cannes. So that, that, was, that was the main thing, you know. The more it won, it wasn't necessarily a stripe on our shoulders. It was just like more people are, are, are able to see it, experience it, and the message can, can move on. So. Yeah, it's not, the industry wars aren't just for the industry, especially anymore, right? It, it just gets it out there more. It opens the platform and amplifies it further. So 
um, great for those, those reasons as well. Um, so good to see you all joining us in the grid. Does anybody um, want to read their question out loud or does anybody else have a question? Love to be able to hear your voices and um, ask Castro and Steve if you have any questions about while they're here. Can I start? <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm taking off. Uh, that's why Castro doesn't um, know my face. Um, but I'm happy to see everyone. And just let you know that I'm your biggest fan, even bigger than Nancy. So yeah, when I grow up, I want to be like you. So please um, remember me. <laughs> Anyway, uh, one of my first questions that I had, uh, since Dr. Dre is owned by black men, do you think that is, uh, that is why it was easier in quotes, of course, uh, to create the campaign, um, this type of campaign? And how do you think, uh, how difficult to push for some campaigns uh, for other companies, especially historically racist companies, and we know those as well, so, um, because I believe like every company has a place to make a strong stance on race issue. So um, that is why I'm curious is what do you think about for other companies that owned by white people would be, uh, what is the, I don't know, how easy for them would be to create that or like what you think, um, what suggestion you would give to those companies? I would if say the question. Yeah, so, not the big, big question. I, I would say you just have to have the receipts to do it. You know, you have to do the work to 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 be able to have a message out there like that. Mm -hmm. You know, like in my the best example I could think of is like um damn, I never damn, what's that ice cream brand again, Steve? Good humor. Ben Jerry's. Uh, oh, Ben and Jerry's, right. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Look, where, where does Ben and Jerry's feel like they have the right to say anything about, like, about um, the message? Do you think? <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you think they have no rights to say anything about? They absolutely. Do? They absolutely mm -hmm. do. That's that, that. That's that's my point. I think I forgot exactly what work they they put in, but I know they have the receipts to you know if you if you go back into the history, they worked with. Um, they worked on jail, I think jail reform, or I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't want to sound, I, I don't want to sound, um, uh, you know, negligent in any way, but um, there we go, Marlene, thanks. They hire ex-cons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they did the work, you know, so they have a right mm -hmm. to, to, to have a say. Um, and I think, yes, for sure, you know, being that Dre, is a black man um, and he's very defiant in, in the way he you know put out his music, the way he attacked music, attacked the you know um, injustice during his heyday. But you know, um, the brand was also very tied to to black culture, and they did it unapologetically when they first came out. Um, it, it really encompassed what it what it meant to to be black and showed images of, of black athletes and black um, musicians when a lot of brands like Bose and Sony or whatever, it was just all about technology. They, they, they brought the human, they put humans on a, on a, on a platform, so. Mm -hmm. And, and, and just that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, say again, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. I, well, let me, let me get, because we're running out of time, Anastasia. Sure. I'm gonna try to get in one last question. Um, and it, it's kind of an interesting one. It's from Bonnie, who is in the management and strategy track. And because you guys are creatives and, and you're talking about all these, all this creative expression and from her perspective, trying to be involved in something like this, what was the coordination and, and, and what are the kind of roles that you think the people on the more managerial side of this have, what's their responsibility to this and how do they contribute? I mean, they had to do, like our account people, our project management people, our strategy, like people were just so invested in different ways. Like they're maybe not on these director calls or 
you know, script writing sessions or whatever, but the conversations that folks on that side had to have with our clients, the amount of talent management that goes into something like this to, to, you know, get all of these famous and otherwise faces on a level, like I, it's just so, so many people committed themselves to this, maybe not to, you know, the, the casting and the wardrobing and the plates on the table, but it doesn't mean that there weren't a million other people, um, you know, in every facet of the industry working on this. We had people, you know, talking to Solange about the score. We had people wrangling the voiceover artist, Toby and Wigway. The day before we shipped, he came in and dumped our scratch track and recorded the VO for this. And some people had to, you know, juggle that management. Um, it was, yeah, you, you can work on work like this if you pour yourself into it. It may just not be in a Photoshop document or a Word document, but there's absolutely spaces to uh, to get in. And our account people, I'd like, I, man, they had to have some conversations. So, yeah. Yeah, those direct conversations with the client when you guys were around, really curious to hear how those went, so. <laughs> Me too, I, Cass and I got off of some of those. Looks. Right? <laughs> Well, I'm, I am so sorry to say that we've run out of time because again, as I started out, I have so many questions for you guys. I could talk about this camp for, campaign forever and probably will. Um, I am so impressed by it. Congratulations a hundred times over. Castro, I'm so proud of you. And see, I'm about to cry. <laughs> I am so proud of you. I can't even tell you. So I'm gonna stop talking about how proud I am of you. Um, and I would like to thank everybody for joining us tonight it, at our Atvic. You guys are the first ones. We weren't going to even do one this fall. Um, we were just going to save them all the spring when we were back on campus. But um, this one really deserved it. Thank you so much for agreeing to be here and sharing your thoughts, your process, um, your intentions. Um, it, it, it's been really, really moving. And I can't I can't thank you enough. And I can't thank all of you for joining us tonight. I hope we see you um, again. I'm the only reason why I'm, 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 I'm wrapping this up is because I know students have to go to class. And I know Castro, if you looked in the participants, you'd probably see some of your faculty who came here to cheer you on. So, um, as well as your, uh, your, your big, big network, network. So Steve, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate you coming. Um, even though, even though you knew the Castro would get all the the, the, the love, the big I mean, love, he deserved it. He, it's all cast. It's all I cast. hope you felt the love too, because man, it's it 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 was it's great. It's really wonderful what you did. And Castro, thank you so much for coming back. And then, thank you everybody for being with our ad pick. Um, the recording is is around if you want to see it. Uh, the messages in the in the in the chat are absolutely overwhelming. Thanking, thanking, thanking you. Have a safe evening, everyone, and we'll see you um, next time we do this. Have a good night.